I got everything, hang on. <laughs> Lights are so bright. Have you heard of 5G? The commercials and ads are everywhere. The industry is doing a really good job getting the word out to us. 5G is coming. And we're excited. Or are we? What is 5G? Well, first generation technology, or 1G, that brought us cell phones. And 2G brought us the ability to send data. 3G gave us the ability to text, and 4G gave us the ability to do video conferencing. And 5G, fifth generation technology, promises driverless cars, better virtual reality, faster downloading speeds, and the connection of everything to everything else. We're going to have a smart city, a smart world. But at what cost? That's the big question. If you look at this slide here, in red, it has the gigahertz, the frequencies used for 4G in comparison to 5G. And you can see 4G is 2.4 to 5 gigahertz. 5G is much higher frequencies, 24 to 90 gigahertz. So we're raising the amount of frequencies we're going to be exposed to with 5G. But also, 5G uses something called millimeter and submillimeter waves. These don't travel well through walls. So in order to make a 5G network effective, they tell us they need to put cell tower equipment, cell antennas, right outside our homes, every two to 10 houses across our entire nation. Your bedroom may have a cell tower antenna right outside, your children's bedroom right outside the window soon, if it doesn't already. These cell antennas emit Radio frequency microwave radiation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In my neighborhood of Huntington, Long Island, you can already find them every two to 10 houses in some neighborhoods. They're calling them small cells, but a better name would be close proximity microwave radiation antennas. Inside of the brown cylinder at the top of the pole, there are three antennas. The antennas are used by telecommunications companies to bring us the service. And then there's a box at the bottom that holds a host of equipment to make it all work. These appeared in my neighborhood overnight. Residents were not notified. They went to work, they came home, and there they had a small cell on the right of way of their property, right outside their bedroom windows. Huntington has 200 of these so far, with hundreds more coming. They're putting them outside of our homes, and they're putting them in our parks. Take a look at this picture. This is a park in my neighborhood. That small cell is right next to a playground. Take a look at this. Look at how close it is to that woman's house. Do we really need these? Is this really necessary? Is this a utility? And who monitors them? Will they be monitored? How do we know? And being so close to our homes, are they safe? The town of Huntington quietly signed a contract. Residents really weren't aware. They're getting money, $2,500 per location, for, per small cell. They're also getting 5% revenue from Crown Castle for 10 years. But did they look at the health studies first? I don't think they did. Because if they have, they would have learned a whole lot of information that would have made them think and pause. I have one five feet outside my backyard fence. It's only 70 feet from my children's beds. And I want to know, are we still safe to live in this house? So I called town hall and I asked what the equipment was and how can I know that it's safe? I was told the equipment is perfectly safe because it's FCC compliant. So what does that mean, FCC compliant? It made me feel better for a minute, but then I did a little research, and it didn't take me long to find that FCC compliance does not equate with safety. Unfortunately, our guidelines in this country come from, or they're stated in the 1996 Telecommunications Act, and that was written in 1996, based on research from the 1980s. Our guidelines are antiquated. 
And they're based on the idea that non-ionizing radiation does not cause biological damage, which couldn't be farther from the truth. The electromagnetic spectrum is broken up into two parts, ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is X-rays, and we know that it does immediate DNA damage. The DNA breaks right away with ionizing radiation. And that's why we protect ourselves from X-rays and any form of this kind of radiation. We take protective measures, we limit our exposure. When it comes to non-ionizing radiation, microwaves, cell towers, um, wireless devices in our homes, when it comes to non-ionizing radiation, because the DNA damage, the break, doesn't happen immediately, it was thought by many for a long time that it, in the long run, would be okay, that we would not have biological damage. But this could not be farther from the truth. The science is in. There are thousands of studies that show non-ionizing radiation damages DNA and causes biological harm to our bodies. This is showing the difference between the limits for this kind of radiation in different countries. And as you can see, the United States and Canada, we have very high limits for this radiation. In fact, if you compare our limits to China, Lithuania, Poland, Italy, Switzerland, you can see that they're 100 times higher here in this country than they are in most other countries. So we have to question, why are our limits so high? And haven't there been studies since 1996? That's when we made our guidelines. Why haven't we revisited them and revised these guidelines? Since 1996, you could take a look at this graph here and see along the bottom there are dates, and the arrow is pointing to the 1996 date. That's when our guidelines were made. And as you can see, it goes straight up because there have been hundreds and thousands of, or hundreds or thousands of studies done since then um, that show biological harm from non-ionizing radiation. Well, our government watchdog, the Government Accountability Office, in 2012, they made the decision to send a report to the FCC asking them to revise, to revisit and revise their antiquated guidelines. And the FCC, in response, opened a window. And what they did was they asked for submissions from experts from all over the world. They wanted to get feedback. They wanted to get people who knew about the topic to comment on it. And they allowed 955 submissions in a two-year period. At the end of those two years, the window closed and everyone waited to see what would happen. Well, do you know what would happen? Nothing. It's still considered an open docket today. They just simply ignored it. How can this be? Well, this might explain some of it. Our FCC, who's in control of our guidelines and our limits, is run by people who may have a conflict of interest. Brendan Carr is the commissioner. He worked as a telecommunications attorney in a law firm before he did that. Then you have Ajit Pai. He's the chairperson of the FCC, the current chairperson. He worked as an attorney for Verizon. And then you have Tom Wheeler, the chairperson before Ajit Pai. Tom Wheeler, he's the one that got the ball rolling on 5G. And he was a lobbyist for the CTIA, <clears throat> for that wireless industry. So it's like the fox guarding the hen house. Who's protecting us? And when it comes to these telecoms, they have a lot of money. They spend between 60 and $80 million a year just to lobby our government, to make sure that we don't hear the truth. Because if we hear the truth, then it affects their business. And take a look at the industry-funded studies. Um, in this graph here, we have industry. We know industry funds studies. It happens all the time. They're using their industry-funded studies to get their message out, their message, which is the wrong message, which is just simply not the truth. In industry-funded studies, they still find harmful effects from non-ionizing radiation, but not nearly as many as when it's peer-reviewed and independent, when it's non-industry. The fact is, the telecom industry has 538 full-time lobbyists 
That's more than the members of Congress in our country. They could have a lobbyist for each member of Congress, working full time. And so we wonder why we don't know the truth. Let's talk about some of the science, because I think it's important that we all are familiar with just some of the more recent, powerful science. In 2011, the World Health Organization classified radiofrequency microwave radiation as a class 2B carcinogen. A class 2B carcinogen means a possible carcinogen. It's in the same category as lead and DDT. Then in 2012, the Bioinitiative Report was released. This was 29 independent scientists from 10 different countries who came together to review 1,800 studies. They concluded that bioeffects are clearly established and they occur at very low levels of exposure to electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiations, radiation. They also concluded that living in close proximity to cell antenna is particularly dangerous because of the constant exposure of the pulsed microwave radiation, which has been shown in thousands of studies to show biological damage. Now, the National Toxicology Program study was a $30 million, 16-year study done right here in the United States. Results came out this past year, 2018. They found clear evidence of heart tumors, brain tumors, brain cancer, DNA damage, and a host of other tumors. And this study was done on 2G and 3G frequencies. We haven't even had the time to test 4G and 5G, which are higher frequencies. But again, they found clear evidence. Then also in 2018, an impressive study came from Italy, the Ramazzini Institute study. They, this is the largest study done to date, the largest study. And they, they used exposure limits that were below what we are allowed to be exposed to in our country. And they found exactly the same results as the NTP study. And they also used the exposure that they used was from base stations rather than cell phones. So it was from exposure from cell towers, small cells, those kinds of things. Clear evidence, heart tumors, brain cancer, DNA damage. If it does, I love this slide, um, it, it just speaks so loudly, uh, it doesn't get clearer than clear evidence. And it breaks my heart when I see this, when I see babies, when I see young children using wireless technology that just simply isn't safe. And it's not our fault because we just haven't gotten the truth. Today, many independent scientists have urged the World Health Organization to reclassify radiofrequency microwave radiation as a probable or a definite carcinogen because of all these recent studies. These small cells outside our homes, the small cell outside my home, it's not safe. And it's not just cancer and DNA damage. We have ADHD and headaches, infertility, diabetes, immune dysfunction, altered brain development, microwave sickness, sleep and memory disturbances, compromised blood-brain barrier. And that's a big one, compromised blood-brain barrier. If your blood-brain bar barrier is, is Compromise, that means it's permeable. It's allowing toxins to get into your brain that should have never been there. So when you have exposure to, let's say, the pesticides that are being applied on somebody's lawn or any of the other toxins in our environment, at the same time that you have exposure to radiofrequency microwave radiation, those toxins are able to get into your brain more readily than they would have been. And one of the biggest problems with all of this, with 5G wireless, is there is no opting out. In my home, I could shut down anything I want. I could turn off my router. I could choose not to have Wi-Fi because it's my home. It's my home. But now, I have no control. This radiation is being forced into my home, into our homes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, into the beds of our children. And by the way, it won't replace 4G. 5G is coming and you will still have the 4G frequencies. It's all cumulative, cumulative, it's adding up. We are going to be swimming in radiation. And I know this is hard to believe, but I need to share it with you. In the 1996 Telecommunications Act, there's a clause that says we are not allowed 
to argue the placement of these antennas, or any cell tower antennas, with the argument of environment or health. It's there. It's really unbelievable. So, you know, what's interesting is that the insurance companies, they have seen the studies, and they know. And we know that because insurance companies refuse to provide coverage for any claim arising from exposure to cell phones, Wi-Fi, or any other source of electromagnetic frequency radiation. EMF is classified as high risk, and they define it as a pollutant. It's typical that Verizon and T-Mobile and Crown Castle and all these companies let their shareholders know, they give them the information in the paperwork, that they may incur significant expenses in the future from lawsuits because of biological effects from wireless radiation. This is another. This one says, if radio frequency emissions from wireless handsets or equipment on our wireless infrastructure are demonstrated to cause negative health effects, potential future claims could adversely affect operations, costs, or revenues. Now, children are small, and they are so much more susceptible and vulnerable to everything in our environment, including this radiation. And this slide is, I like this one because it, it's, it's so clear. Uh, you can see the absorption from cell phone radiation in a five-year-old child, a 10-year-old child, and then an adult. See how much more deeply it gets into their bodies? It's the same with any exposure for children. They have, they have um, their bodies are growing, their cells are dividing, their immune systems aren't yet developed. We need to protect our children. They deserve a fair chance at health. There's an international appeal going on. 250 scientists from 41 countries have come together. And they have serious concerns. And they're trying to make a difference here. Based upon peer-reviewed published research, this is quoted in their document. We have serious concerns regarding the ubiquitous and increasing exposure to EMF generated by electric and wireless devices. And what about our property values? Would you buy the house with the cell tower out front or without the cell tower out front? These are absolutely affecting our property values, our hard-earned money. And it's not just a health concern. We've got the property value concern, and we also have the concern of our privacy. Once all of your devices are connected to everything else, they're going to know everything about you. And you know what they're going to do with that information? They're going to sell it. You're a commodity. So what's the solution here? I'll tell you what the solution is. Wired technology. That's what we need. We need to connect to safe, high-speed, high-bandwidth internet through installing fiber cables to every business, home, and school. Wired technology is safe technology. Now, the good news is there are some people speaking out about this who are influential. So Michigan State Senator Patrick Kolbeck, he has testified against 5G, and he's really raising awareness. And we commend him. Then we have more good news. Um, Senator Blumenthal in Connecticut and Congresswoman Eshoo, they have demanded to see the scientific data that proves 5G does not pose health risks, including cancer. They gave the FCC a deadline of December 16th to give them a response. And that was 2018. The FCC so far has ignored them. But we can go to our own federal, state, and Congress representative and we can ask them to write their own letter to the FCC and to support what Senator Blumenthal and Congresswoman Eshoo are doing. I feel that they're heroes. At the very beginning, when I took all my concerns that I had, <laughs> that I had come up with after doing all this research, I took my concerns to representatives. And in one of the politicians' offices, I spoke with a staff member who said to me, you're the only person coming to us with this message. No one else is talking about this. No one else is concerned around here. And politicians, they prioritize according to how many concerns and phone calls and letters that they get from the people. So you really need to start a, a group, get a petition together, get more people involved. You don't have a lot of power when you're alone. 
And that was when I knew that I needed to take this to the next level. So we, I, I'm so grateful that today we have this activist group, Citizens for 5G Awareness, and together we're working really hard, tirelessly, to bring the message out to the public that this is coming, it's not safe, and that we need to protect ourselves and do everything we can. And you know, I hope that every one of you watching can find a group in your community that you can connect with, and if there isn't one, start one. This needs to come from us. Begin learning as much as you can. Some really great websites are environmentalhealthtrust.org, tele um, telecompowergrab.org, and soon, citizens for 5 g awarenessorg <laughs> And then there's another website called We Are the Evidence. And these are great places to just start getting enough information where you can speak about this and understand it more deeply so that you could start a group, pass the information on to other people. Another thing you can do is um, this documentary, Generation Zapped, it's not about 5G, it's about wireless technology and the dangers associated with it. But if you could get this documentary shown in your library or any other venue that is willing to show it, I urge you to do so. Ask your library to order it so it's available for patrons. It'll get the conversation started and it'll help people understand that there are dangers to wireless technology. Because as I said before, industry is doing a really good job of making sure we don't get the truth. <clears throat> and when people have the truth, that's when this is like a springboard. From there, they can join you because they'll understand the urgency here. Speak at your town meetings. Um, this has been really great for us. When we speak at our town meetings, other activists who come to the town meetings, they hear the issue and they, they get involved. So we're really growing um, because of, of that. I also urge you all to meet with, write to, and call your federal, state, and local representatives. Make sure they're aware of the issue and ask them what they can do. And give them ideas. Ask them to put a moratorium, a congressional moratorium, on the deployment of these small cells in residential areas. Small cell antennas don't belong outside of our homes, outside the windows where our children are sleeping. Ask them to amend our antiquated guidelines. That needs to happen. Write articles for local papers. You never know. Submit an article, they may print it. Buy a radio frequency meter if you can. Maybe you can get together with a bunch of people and just have one to share. It's so important to see this radiation. We can't smell it, we can't feel it, we can't hear it. Most of us can't feel it, some can. Um, but just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not harmful. So I urge you to, to get away so that you could see it. The Acousticom is, I think, like about $150. That's a, a really good one. That's reasonably priced, and um, once you start to see it, then you can make changes in your own home to mitigate the effects, to mitigate the wireless uh, frequencies, and then you can test again after you, after you make changes to see that you really are making a difference and making your home a healthier place to be. Also, if there are any local groups that you could speak with, once you get a little bit of knowledge about the topic, I suggest you find them and ask them if they would mind if you came and, and did a little presentation. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, anybody that will listen. We're not getting the protection that we need on a federal level. It's all up to us. This needs to be a grassroots movement. Please get involved. It's urgent. It's all coming so fast. And we need to just be as strong as we can together and, and make changes. And I'd like to leave you with this quote, one of my favorite quotes of all time. Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you for listening. <laughs>